Um, yeah, should we let this thing rip? Let's do it. All right, I'll, I'll just uh, get started. This is Scott Snelling with Jason Toth here. Uh, this is our first podcast, and it's going to be, I'm going to do a bit of a presentation on the collapse of the innovative FIU pedestrian bridge. I posted some slides on the website because uh, a lot of this stuff is pretty visual. We'll try to talk about it in a way so the only the audio file makes sense, um, but you should be able to get get the images for reference too. And and Jason, feel free to interrupt as as often as you as you like. We don't have to wait to the end to discuss. Although I hope we will discuss at the end as well. Yeah. Hey, Scott. I, what I wanted to say first off is, man, I'm really excited to discuss this uh, bridge collapse. I especially with you. I mean, I, this is clearly a very tragic event, but I do find structural collapses pretty fascinating and, and really in many ways, but because they are rare. And on top of that, you're a highly experienced and skilled bridge engineer. So I think this is going to be a great conversation. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I think it's a fascinating, a fa it's a fascinating um, incident. And um, I was talking with the state bridge engineer of Minnesota recently, and, and she felt like this was going to be our generation's Kansas City hotel walkway collapse, if you know that one. So higher regency. Um, yeah. I think this is going to be a very significant incident that's going to make big changes to the industry. And even though the collapse happened two years ago, we're just kind of at the beginning of of making sense what happened and what the bridge industry is going to do about it to not have things like this happen again. Um, so to to start us off here, um, the University City Prosperity Pedestrian Bridge. Uh, collapsed on March 15th, 2018, and it was in Miami, Florida. Um, six, six people uh, were killed and, and 10 people were were injured. And um, so obviously that's a pretty serious thing. There was an 18 year old female that was in the public, a, a, a number the, a number of um, middle-aged men and then and that were in the public and then one construction worker. So uh, I would like to take a minute to sort of acknowledge and and think about them and as we talk about it the project especially as an engineer I can get very excited about the ideas um, that we're examining and that and because it's fascinating um, but this has changed people's lives um, families lives you know f for the worse uh, permanently I think uh, as we talk about infrastructure and how it supports society and really engineering as a profession our first duty is the health, uh, welfare, and safety. And so when, when you have an incident like this that that uh, goes against that, um, then it, it, it's, it's very difficult, difficult at yeah. many levels. Yeah, so the, I mean, the first, um, the first thing of engineering ethics is to hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public, and uh, this project failed to do that. Um, to me, it has a lot. I, the, the, the story of this project, to me, um, is kind of like um, Icarus from Greek mythology. Um, but the story, as I see it, is a story of ambition and not incompetence. And so we'll kind of get in, into that as, as we go. So um, as far as the, uh, the, the entities that were involved in this, um, I've, I've kind of taken the names off and I I'm, I'm, don't want to talk about names. This isn't about blaming the specific individuals or, um, or, or companies or so forth. Um, but the, the project was mostly federal funded. That, that comes from FHWA and USDOT. Um, it, then they, they send it, the money to FDOT, Florida DOT. And then in, in this case, there was a local agency, which was the Florida International University that kicked in a little bit of their own money and then they were administering the project. And um, they hired a design build team. They had a design build competition. And then they also hired uh, independently a construction manager to, to, to review the construction of the design build team. After the collapse, all of those entities basically get walled off for almost two years, a year and a half, while 
um, the National Transportation Safety Board is brought in and they, they conduct um, a super detailed investigation. And that culminates in a report that was published last December. Um, but in the meantime, for um, that, while they're doing their investigation, um, everybody that's outside of that bubble uh, basically gets no information. And um, so that's, I was actually involved in a team that, um, w where um, the US Department of Transportation Office of Inspector General, they, they wanted some answers sooner. Um, so they, they engage um, some technical experts to, to basically um, just quickly tell them a summary of what, what do you think happened here? <laughs> Is there anything we can do now rather than waiting two years to get a report um, from NTSB that, that we can start working on things now? So that, that's where my interest um, in, this, in this project uh, started. Um, but the things I'm gonna be talking about now is really all the stuff that the NTSB um, has since since published and some of the conclusions we can draw from that um, but, but yeah so I'm, go cur ahead. I'm curious uh, of the initial working theory maybe we can show and uh, through conversation here how that matured and progressed because as you mentioned the National Transportation Safety Board investigation we have access to that now but what were some of the initial working theories and then maybe we can see how they compare to what the National Transportation uh, Safety Board came up with. Yeah, I'll, I'll get into that. Okay. And um, right. it basically, um, our, our stuff lined up the super close with what NTSB um, later found, formally found and, and, and reported. Okay. So, so kind of the, the, my, the, what I wanted to talk about, um, just an outline of what I'll talk about. There's, I'll just give a real, um, an overview of, of the project and the collapse. And then I'll talk about the design errors at node 11, 12. And that, that's something we identified in our report where um, we had said early on, hey, it, it, this sure looks like there's a design error and it caused this a failure at node 11, 12. And that's what brought this bridge down. Um, we weren't, that was just based on our review and experience and, and uh, thoughts. Uh, NTSB spent two years or a year and a half doing detailed, you know, there were physical models, there were, there were calculations, uh, independent, multiple independent models, and super detailed work. And then they said, yes, uh, this failure initiated from a designer at Node 11 12. Um, they st stated that with certainty um, or emphatically in their report, although the design firm uh, does disagree and we could talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then, so that's, uh, we'll talk about the probable cause statement, um, which is NTSB's formal finding of, of all their investigation. And then I, I'd like to talk a little bit about a root cause analysis. And that's, this is basically my own opinion, but um, it's not really the job of NTSB to start trying to get to root causes. They, they, they find what's called a probable cause or I think it's something closer to approximate cause, um, like the node 11, 12 failed. Well, I think you got to dig a lot deeper to, and to get to the root cause of what series of events led to that designer. Um, so what we can talk about that. And maybe just uh, for those that are joining us, it might be helpful to talk a little bit about when we say cause and you've thrown out proximal cause, root cause, um, as I understand, proximal cause is sort of the closest. It's like an action that produces foreseeable consequences without intervention from anybody else. And I, I guess that sounds a little bit more like a legal term. Um, and so I know proximal cause is used uh, in legal jargon. It has its legal definition. But as you highlighted, it seems to be the event that is closest or immediately responsible for that event. Whereas, I mean, I don't know if this is the best analogy, but I'm just thinking like if there was a bar fight and you see two guys, one guy's leaving with a broken nose, you know, like the proximate cause might be this other guy punched him in the face. Right. Whereas like the root cause might be because the other guy who just punched him in the face was, you know, doing something with the other guy's wife or whatever. Right. You know, you're like getting the, a few. The ultimate cause or root cause. Yeah. The NTSB report would say, you know, 
the the fist hit him in the nose. <laughs> and what I'm trying to talk about is like, well, it looks like there were a few things going on before these guys entered the bar. Yeah, these uh, I don't some know. of these reports show <laughs> a clear linkage of causation that is evidence based and proven when you start to move further from that into that ultimate cause, that's where the interesting discussion goes, but also there's, there's question about the, uh, the that's getting exact into the causal of my, link of yeah. my opinion, but I think it's, I think we can draw some conclusions and I think sure. it's important to try to draw those uh, conclusions about what led to this. Sure. Um, so um, the, the NTSB stuff, if for people that are, you know, very interested in, in this collapse. I mean, it's super authoritative. There's a ton of stuff there. Uh, you can look on the show notes of the blog post. Um, we'll have links to all that stuff. Um, they, they have a five minute long YouTube video, which is amazing in the density of information they pack into that five minutes. They've got this report. It's like a 154 page report called uh, Pedestrian Bridge Collapse over Southwest 8th Street, Miami, Florida, H-A-R 1902. And um, that's the authoritative report. Uh, they also have a public docket. So you can see like, you can see the text message that the construction worker sent as soon as he saw the cracks increase while he was jacking the bridge. And uh, you can see, um, read all the depositions of the um, design engineers and the uh, the engineer of record and, and then his individual staff members and um, the company president and uh, all that stuff's on the website to read and it's super fascinating. Um, and then they also have a board meeting, which is a three and a half hour long video of the NTSB internally discussing the report before they form formally published it. Uh, and that's also pretty fascinating. So I'll start off just, uh, I kind of mentioned the, the outline. So starting off with the overview, I'll just talk a little bit about the bridge type. Do you have something, Jason? Do you, you look like you had a question. Okay. Yeah. So, so the type of bridge, what type of bridge is this? Well, I mean, it's, this bridge is so unique that um, there, there's no name for the type of bridge that it is. Um, it's, you could call it a faux cable stay bridge. It looks like a cable stay bridge, but it's not a cable stay bridge. You could call it a post tension concrete uh, truss bridge. And that's what it is. They also called it, you know, like a concrete girder with web cutouts. It's, you could do that too. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, I don't think anybody's ever going to try to build this type of bridge <laughs> again. And uh, so this type of bridge, it was under construction when it collapsed. It basically never existed and nobody's going to try it again. So I don't think it's ever going to have a name for this type of bridge. Um, the bridge that like, shall not be named. <laughs> yes, it's that unique. Um, and so it looks like a cable stay bridge, but the, the tower and all the what looks like cables, those are just steel pipes. Those are all non-structural. Um, so and then there's a truss. It's a single plane concrete truss. So first of all, normally trusses are steel, not concrete. Uh, concrete has no tensile strength, so it's kind of a, a not, it's not been used for trusses. Um, and then even more so, even if this was a steel truss instead of concrete, it would still be weird because the truss members are in a single plane. Normally you'd have two planes of truss for some level of redundancy. And then even if you had two planes of truss, it would still be weird because the diagonals, you can see they're not evenly spaced. They're spaced to align with the aesthetic. Uh, the, the faux cables above, all the truss members are set to align with them. So they're all spaced irregularly in order to align with, um, with, a, with an aesthetic they're going after. So there's a lot of, um, it has some pretty complex design decisions and geometries that were driven by um, aesthetics, not not a structural logic. It's, it, it looks great. It, it's very um, aesthetically logical, just not structurally um, logical. And when it collapsed, the main span had been erected, but the back span and the tower and all the pipes that look like cables, none of that stuff was ever erected. Um, so Part of when I called this a Icarus bridge, I mean, it, it would have been very easy. There's um, 
um, you know, if you're riding your bike on a trail and you see a, a, a steel truss bridge, that's kind of like a box shaped truss with two planes of, it, it would have been very easy to use that type of bridge in this, this setting. This bridge goes over a canal on one side, a, a small canal, and then a, a pretty wide arterial road, the Southwest 8th Street or US 41 on, on the other side. Um, but uh, you could almost, if you wanted to just do a, a steel truss bridge, pedestrian bridge, um, they could have almost ordered this out of a ca uh, catalog. I mean, it's like they wouldn't even have to design anything. So um, they were obviously trying to do something much more. They wanted to do explicitly, we're, we're trying to do something unique and signature and architectural and aesthetic and, and push the envelope. Okay, so that, that kind of covers the type of, of bridge. I don't know if you have any questions on that. If not, I'll, I'll move forward to the collapse sequence. Yeah, I, I think that one thing that I, I do draw out of is, as you talk about the design of the bridge is the lack of redundancy. And with, the, <laughs> yeah. with a military combat engineering background, there's an old adage that says, uh, two is one, one is none. <laughs> it just highlights the importance of redundancy. And and speaking as an engineer, the idea of a factor of safety and including redundancy and in a structure in which lives are at risk, um, that always maybe puts the hairs on the back of my neck <laughs> straight yeah. up. So, so I'd be love to talk about that a little bit more. What's interesting is the bridge designers, um, the engineer of record did testify under oath um, that the bridge was redundant and they used, um, mm -hmm. They used uh, in their calculations like factors that um, applied to redundant members. Um, so your average engineer looking at that would say, how could they possibly think that? And it, I mean, especially in retrospect. Um, but, you know, you gotta, they, 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 they mostly do box girder bridges and cable stay bridges. And this kind of, this bridge was sort of in that vein and in a box girder bridge you just have one box girder but it's considered redundant because you have you know two webs and then you have multiple post tensioning strands in each web and top and bottom so the the the, the strands are redundant um even though the, there's only one box and then like for a cable stay bridge you could have a single plane like this and it would still be redundant because you've got all those cables above so um, the, the member that failed actually had had two um, post-tensioning rods in it, uh, not one. And there are all these aesthetic members that if they were structural members, it, this would be redundant even with a single plane of truss. So it looks, it's a, the, the question of redundancy is not as totally straightforward as it seems at the beginning. Although at the end of the day, it, it only took one node to fail and that brought the thing down at the stage of construction it was at. Right. Um, okay, so the collapse sequence, um, again, it's a little hard uh, for just audio, audio listeners. Uh, hopefully you'll uh, pull up some photos afterwards, but um, basically there was a worker on top of the bridge. Um, he was jacking a, a load into a member and right when he finished uh, jacking it, the, the bridge collapsed onto the roadway. And uh, they were they closed off two lanes, but that left something like six lanes of, of traffic were still open and underneath the bridge when it when it collapsed. Um, so the, the sequence you can see there there was a driver with a dash cam dashboard cam. That, that gives you just like a, you can see in time lapse the whole um, collapse occur. And you can see that member, it's called a member 11 and it meets at node 1112. It's just on the end of the bridge where eventually the tower was gonna be erected. But right now it's just the end of a truss bridge. And that diagonal truss member just pushed out the back and you can see it, a puff of dust basically appear out the back of the bridge. And then the bridge just you know, pivots down. That once it's lost that, it's 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 not a structure anymore. It's just um, just comes right down and onto the onto the traffic that's waiting for um, a stoplight to turn green. So, if 
I don't know if you have any questions on the collapse sequence or I'll go into the construction the, sequence. The, the collapse sequence, I encourage those that are joining us to uh, look at the pictures because it's, um, wow, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nightmare, especially for yeah. any bridge engineer. I've, I've, I've been an engineer of record on, you know, fairly complex bridge projects where you put your stamp on there and um, it's it's pretty harrowing to, to think about. I mean, I can relate to what it would be like to get this sort of news as an engineer of record that this has happened on your bridge. Yeah. It, would be, it would be terrible. It's any bridge engineer's nightmare. Um, so the construction sequence, this, they use accelerated bridge construction, which is, you know, somewhat newish, but it's, it's, it's not totally cutting edge. It's, it's, it's fairly well established. And basically what that means is you, you build the span offsite, oftentimes right nearby. So here they just had, they built the span, uh, not in its final location, but just next to it. Um, and then what they do is they close the roadway overnight and um, they have a mover, a special, they call it SPMT. Uh, I'd have to think about the acronym for a second. Self-propelled modular transporter is what it's called. But this thing, it's a whole lot of wheels that are controlled, like, you know, remote controlled. And you put your bridge on there and you uh, wheel it out and put the bridge in place in the middle of the night. So the public basically goes to bed. Uh, they wake up in the morning and there's a bridge uh, in its place and there's no traffic disruption other than in the wee hours of the night. So that, that's what was done with this bridge. And um, it, it, it does add some complexity to the job. And uh, so in the casting yard, one of the important things to know is they, they cast the truss in three sections. So first they cast the deck um, and then there's, there's all kinds of post tensioning in the deck. Uh, and then they cast the diagonals. Um, and then they, they cast the canopy, um, which is basically like, so the deck is like the bottom cord of the truss and the canopy is like the top cord of the truss. Um, and then the diagonals are, are in between. And, uh, each of those three parts of the bridge were done in three separate pores. So that means there's cold joints where the deck meets the diagonals. There's a cold joint where the diagonals meet the canopy, there's a cold joint. And that's super important to know and becomes um, you know, super key to, to what happens here and, and the disputes between the designer and the company and so forth. Um, so uh, all this was built on shoring uh, in, the, in the casting yard. It was hardened. Uh, then they, they, put it, they put it on uh, the self-propelled modular transporters and uh, there were periods of time where the bridge was supported in the casting yard, you know, very, very similarly to the way it was supported once it was up on the piers, you know, a week or two later. Um, there were a few minor differences uh, in the support condition, but they were, they were quite similar. So um, then in the middle of the night, they just wheel this thing out like I, like I talked about. Um, but what's important is when the bridge was still in the, in the casting yard, there were a few cracks that were noted and, um, they were at, uh, node 11, 12, and they were pretty minor. They were something that was noted. It was something that was of concern. Uh, the, the designer made sure to, to recommend, you know, that that area be monitored super closely during the move. And, um, that, that area was basically watched as the bridge was moved. Um, so the, the bridge was moved into place. It was monitored super closely. They set the bridge down out on the, out on the piers and uh, everybody was there and everything was fine. They looked at those cracks. They hadn't gotten bigger. And um, basically everybody celebrated and went home. And uh, even the two main staff level engineers, not the engineer of record, um, both went on vacation, like the day after that. So they'd sort of been working super hard to achieve this milestone. They, they achieved it and um, they kind of celebrated. Uh, even uh, some key members went on vacation and then um, they went, they left the site. Uh, the, the bridge designer was never on site full time. They just came out for the move and very occasionally. 
um, there was a construction manager that was a construction inspector that was on site full time, but the bridge designer was not. Um, and then, you know, a few days later, the next part of construction was um, to, to remove post tensioning from those diagonals. And the reason why is they, they had only post tensioned those diagonals for the move, because when you're supporting the, the span on the, on the self propelled <clears throat> modular transporters, the, the ends of the bridge are cantilevered off and that puts the diagonals in tension. So in order to counteract that, they, they put in post tensioning into those concrete members so it can support that tension. But once you set the bridge back down and for the rest of its life, those diagonals are in compression and you don't need that post tensioning anymore. So, so the next step was just to remove the, the tension from those post tensioning rods because that was just a temporary construction thing. And as soon as they did that, the, those cracks that in the casting yard at node 1112 that had been very small, um, they opened up big, huge, and um, like, you know, inches deep and in, you know, an, an inch wide and inches deep. And if you look in the bridge, ins bridge inspection manual, I mean, I, I, I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but, you know, to have a, a like a hairline crack in any, any concrete structure, uh, even a post-tension concrete structure is, you know, that just happens. To have a crack that's like, inches deep, <laughs> inch wide in a post, in a brand new post-tension concrete structure. I mean, this is like unbelievably concerning, um, yeah. especially, especially if it's a not in a non redundant area. Yeah. Notice if, as you mentioned, like this is at a joint, which connections are always an area of concern. When we think about structures and I encourage those that are joining us definitely again, those pictures they're uh, they're eye opening because not only is an inch deep, in some cases, an inch plus wide is a long, uh, long shear cracks. <laughs> Very and so the, the construction worker that was doing this, I mean, they, they for a living, tension and detension, um, uh, po 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 post-tensioning members in concrete structures and bridges and buildings and whatever. I mean, all they do is go around and jack concrete tendons and, and rods. And, the, and so that worker, he unjacked the load off off this rod and it cracked and he he uh, sent a text message with a photo of the cracks to his supervisor and said it cracked to hell um so i mean the the flag was kind of raised from the very moment these cracks happened um but i i forget if that, that might have happened on a wednesday or a thursday or a friday um the bridge the bridge designer wasn't there um and, you know, over the weekend, they tried to make sense of it, but it's hard to, you know, he was, the bridge designer is struggling to get the right information. The, the, the key staff level people are on vacation, like on a cruise, totally uncontactable. And um, the bridge designer came to the site on Monday morning, having kind of worked on it over the weekend. Um, and the, the bridge collapsed Monday afternoon. Um, yeah, go ahead, Jason. One, one thing I would even venture to say that if you were not a construction worker or engineer and, and you were walking by this bridge and saw these cracks, you would find them dis, disconcerting. <laughs> that's the size we're talking about that these cracks are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's true. So you, I think obviously a part of this tragedy is, is um, you know, I think if the bridge designer had been able to be on site sooner. I, I don't think the bridge designer understood the, the magnitude of, of the cracks for, for those crucial few days while the bridge was sitting there with huge cracks but hadn't yet collapsed. And the, the, you know, the public is still going underneath the bridge. Um, that's part of the failure here. It's surely not a root cause. This is getting way out. To, I mean, things should have never progressed to this level. Right. Um, but once they've progressed to that level, part of the tragedy is that they, they weren't able to at least just get the public from, from under the bridge and, and, and close down that roadway. Yeah, there, there are some clear mitigations that even as we move away from the root cause that have, could have reduced or eliminated uh, loss of life and some of the consequences. Yeah, so some... If you're ready to move on to the next part, we can talk a little bit about the design errors at node 1112. 
Um, so we talked a little bit about the post tensioning um, and the, you know, the location. This was at kind of a key construction stage. You know, once the backspan and the and the tower were erected, I mean, there would kind of be no way for this member to fail in the way it had. And they were actively working on erecting the backspan and tower. So if, if it could have held on just a little bit longer, they, they would have dodged a bullet um, there. Um, the, the NTSB made some, made some renderings that show the crack patterns and, and so forth that are very useful in kind of understanding uh, what's there. And another key thing to know is that um, the a drain, drain pipes and electrical conduits had been run through this node. In addition to, I mean, there's the deck comes together, diagonal member 11 comes together, uh, member 12 comes together, and then below there's a diaphragm. Uh, most of these things have rebar and then they also have like longitudinal, vertical, diagonal post tensioning in all different directions. And then to top it off, they're sticking a drain pipe through there and some electrical conduit penetrations through there. So, I mean, this joint is just deadly complex. I mean, it, there's just a ton of stuff going on there. And um, I mean, I would pity the the one, the person or the engineer that had to detail these connections and coordinate it with the different disciplines, which I think is part of what was lacking. And and those that are unfamiliar with concrete, I think that uh, that it's it's interesting about those cracking patterns is that that's that trace evidence and almost the fingerprints that show um, the mode of failure and a lot really tell a lot about how things came apart. Yeah. So again. The, the, I'd encourage people to look at the photos to really understand the, the that connection. We'll have them on our on our website. So the the NTSB made uh, well. They they actually engaged uh, the Federal Highways Administration. Uh, they had two different engineers make two different models with two different software packages in order to check the the design load. And they basically found that there was, it wasn't just Node 11, 12, but there were um, many members that were um, that were basically insufficient for the load that were the, and so, um, of the, you know, maybe a third of the, of the, of the members and nodes in the, in the bridge, um, were under designed basically that that's what the FHWA and NTSB uh, found and published in their, in their report. So, uh, the, the FHWA, basically said that 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 node that failed node 11 12 there there should have been uh 18 square inches of of um steel there and um the the designer had provided four square inches um again the designer would dispute that and there's ongoing lawsuits um one of the key things to know is the designer had said that that surface between that cold joint between the deck and the diagonal should be roughened uh, I think amplitude about a quarter inch or something like that. Um, and they had, they had referenced a Florida um, manual a, as well as in an email, um, sent an email reminder to the contractor. And, and um, the finding is that area wasn't roughened. And, and uh, full size physical tests show that that joint um, would have been 70% stronger if that surface had been roughened. So this is this is the dis sort of part of the ongoing dispute between the designer and um, and the NTSB and FHWA. We'll see where it goes. Um, the FHWA and NTSB would say yes, it, it would be stronger if the joint had been roughened um, as it was supposed to, but um, it still was inadequate, insufficiently designed, even if it had been roughened. That's what, what they say. So we'll kind of see where that plays out. I mean, that could take a year or two more longer for, for that to all kind of play out um, and see what the findings are. If, if um, do, do you have any questions on that? Should we move on to the probable cause? All right, there's a, so, so the NTSB basically, that they spend all this time doing the work and it all rolls up to a probable cause statement, um, which, which again, we'll have on our website. I'm not gonna read it because it's like super detailed, but basically they blame the designer for, for, um, for under-designing uh, 
the node 1112 and the trust member. Uh, they also just blame everybody else involved in the project for not closing the roadway. Um, there's some real issues with the independent design review. Uh, they blame them for not catching this. Um, they basically, there had been some pretty intense negotiations between the independent reviewer and the designer, the, the, the bridge designer hired the independent reviewer. So the, the reviewer worked for the designer, which to me Public is kind of, of a, to me kind of a conflict, and they had to pay them. <laughs> so that's kind of a conflict of interest, in my opinion, not a good way to set things up. Um, and, and then the, the independent reviewer said they were only gonna check the members that, uh, in the final condition. They weren't gonna check nodes and they weren't gonna check construction sequences. That's what they thought was in their scope of work. Again, that's a dispute between whether that was required or not. And if you look at this manual that referenced that thing, it says actually it didn't matter that what they thought they had to check, they actually had to check the other stuff. And that, that's under dispute basically, but um, we'll kind of see, again, see how that turns out. But the, the independent reviewer didn't catch this stuff because they weren't looking for it because they felt like it wasn't in their scope of work at that time to check nodes and construction sequences. Um, so now we're going to get a little bit to the root cause analysis. So this is mostly, this is mostly my opinion, <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, uh, we got to get away from just the strict facts and report findings a little bit to try to peel back the onion to root causes. So one of the things I did is I looked at the different bridges that were um, in the designer's proposal. So these are the bridges that they said, hey, look at the designs that we've done before that are super relevant to this project and why we're the best team to design this bridge for you. So the Florida International University Bridge, um, the, the construction cost was about $9.4 million. Um, and if you kind of work that out, if you assume, oh, well, the most an engineer could negotiate is 10% of the construction costs would be about $900,000. Um, they would have, and if they build out $150 an hour, blah, 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 I, I calculated full-time equivalent years. So that means they could assign, I calculated 1.6 people to, to this. So they could assign one person for 1.6 years to do all the engineering on this project, or they could, um, or they could, um, you know, assign 1.6 people for one year. That if you kind of see, this is just a rough take on, on the sort of resources they had available to do this design. And, and this bridge was super complex. Um, what's sort of interesting, if you look at the comparable projects in their proposal, they had done pedestrian bridges before for small budgets. So they, they'd done a different bridge, uh, pedestrian bridge where I calculated, it was a $7.2 million construction cost. So of a similar scope, but it was not a very complex bridge. I mean, it was, it was, you know, not totally routine, but it, it, they weren't inventing a new type of structure that has never existed before and that there's no name for. Um, one of the other bridges they submitted uh, was a cable stay bridge, a Sunstein Skyway bridge, which is famous and iconic. And um, it's super complex. You know, I mean, and, and that was probably, as I, I'm sure that was the first single plane cable stay bridge in the United States. It probably been one in Europe before, but they were basically inventing a new type of bridge that at least had never existed in the United States before. So this firm could do that sort of thing, but you see there they had the, uh, a full-time equivalent of 44 years of, of person power to engineer power to apply to that. I mean, they had orders of magnitude more resources available to design that project compared to the one they're doing here. So to me, I think the dangerous thing, it's they were trying to do something super complex on a super shoestring budget. And um, I think if they're trying to do, they have a proven history of doing um, things on a shoestring budget and they have a history of doing complex things. But I think to try to do super complex things on a shoestring budget is where you get into a dangerous area. And I don't see evidence of them doing that before. And it's not something I would want to do. And I think that's where they kind of got into danger. So just to talk a little bit about um, the engineering budget, the, the total fee um, 
was for the designer was $905,000. But that includes things like landscape design. They had $120,000 for landscape design. They had lighting design. I forget how much was in there for lighting, but tens of thousands of dollars for lighting design. When you get down to the superstructure design, which all the innovation in this structure was basically the superstructure design task, they had $119,000. So they provided themselves more money to design the landscaping than they had um, to invent a completely new type of bridge superstructure, um, which is to me crazy. I mean, that's like scary. And um, so if you look at, they, they, they ended up providing 51 superstructure uh, drawings for the bridge. And if you, if you assume an average rate of $150 an hour, which is, you know, about right, um, then they would have had 18 hours per, per drawing for the bridge superstructure to do that. That includes writing the specs, that includes calculations, uh, that includes likely site visits and, and all this stuff. Soup, soup to nuts. And, and that's, you know, bridge designers, that's the sort of thing you use to kind of, there's kind of two rules of thumb. One is we probably, the most we can ask for is 10% of the construction cost. And probably we want to be billing out bridge jobs at about 70 an hour if you're going to design a bridge. That's just rough rule of thumb. If it's more complex, you probably want to ask for more you know, 100, 125 hours of drawing if it's a really complex bridge. If it's super routine, you know, maybe you can knock it down to 60, 55, I don't know. I mean, but 70 is like pretty tight for a typical, you know, bridge design job. So um, I think what happened here is there's just a real, those two rules of thumb don't line up. And the, the, the market power the bridge firm had is basically the most they could negotiate was that 10% of the construction cost. It's just not really practical to ask for more than that. But that left them <laughs> that left them really short on the bridge design. You can see how that happens. If you're building a big bridge, you've got to buy a lot of concrete and a lot of steel. And it and and um, it's it doesn't take longer to draw a lot of concrete and a lot of steel, you know, it, it, but you can negotiate a higher fee if you draw more concrete and steel. It's just an oddity of market power and negotiations in my opinion. And, mm -hmm. and it, it kind of bit them here. Do you have any questions on that? I, I think that it's interesting how some of the context and I guess general environmental conditions um, as far as the market environment, the bidding environment, how that contributed to uh, the failure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here, this is this is my opinion for root cause analysis. Is I'll go through the six six whys, or I, I thought I'd change it to five whys, but maybe I still have six here. But the, this is a technique for um, you know it's something Toyota used. I see you smiling, Jason. This is, my, this is probably part of um, what's it called. Um, Six Sigma Ninja or whatever, Black Belt. This is, I think it comes from there. There's a lot of places that use this sort of technique. It's a common technique. You just keep asking why. Go back so, again. Yep. So I want to keep asking why. And, and uh, okay, so why did the FIU bridge collapse? Well, okay, it's because uh, Trust Node 1112 failed in shear at the cold joint um, with the deck. Okay, so that's our first why. Well, why did it fail there? Well, because the capacity of the node was insufficient to support the demand, which is the loads imposed uh, by the partially erected span during construction. Well, what, why, why was the capacity and demand, why was the capacity insufficient to support the demand? Well, because the bridge designer made a design error in calculating both the capacity and an error in calculating the demand. Uh, at node 11, 12. And they would also add, and the contractor um, didn't roughen the surface. Okay, ask why again. Okay, well, well why, why did that happen? Um, because the bridge designer was attempting to invent a completely new type of bridge that had never existed before. Uh, the bridge designer agreed to a superstructure fee that was a fraction of what was typical. Okay, well, why would they do that, <laughs> you know? Um, well, 
because the FIU request for pr proposals solicited for an innovative signature bridge while imposing a strict price cap. Um, apparently the bridge designer and independent design reviewer were eager to please the owner and win the work. Uh, commercial pressures prevailed over sound judgment. So, the, I mean, the bridge design, design build team, the bridge design firm, they were trying to do exactly what the request for proposals asked for. They said, they made it very clear that they want this to be a signature bridge. They want it to be innovative. Um, FIU is a center for bridge, accelerated bridge construction. They really want to um, voice themselves. They want, they want to be recognized as like, this is the place where super innovative bridge work is done. And this was going to be their exhibition project. And um, they had $19 million and they said, if your bid comes higher than that, we're throwing it in the garbage, we're not looking at it. Um, and uh, so th that's the incentives the RFP set up. And um, the bridge de design build team and designer, I mean, I think they in good faith tried super hard to do something really difficult and they failed. And so, so that's, um, that's kind of my opinion on, on there. And, and I don't think when I, when I say that, you know, FIU wrote that into their proposal, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong for a customer saying like, I want this super amazing stuff and I want it cheap. I mean, <laughs> that's what Amazon is built on. I mean, in a lot of ways, that's what America is built on. Um, I don't think it's immoral or wrong that they wrote that into the RFP, but they created a supercharged environment that, that led to this really high risk uh, outcome. And so I think it's important for owners to, to recognize that when they're writing RFPs, you know, the sort of incentive systems they set up are, uh, they, they, they set up everything that happens from there on out in the job when they write that RFP. They set up the incentive systems that the firms respond to. And um, I'll just do a little postscript and then um, can open it, open it to you, Jason. That, so most of the firms involved in this are bankrupt or gone as far as the contractor, or the independent reviewer was bought out and their name has been discontinued. Um, the, the bridge designer is, is um, fighting for their life and they, they, they sued the federal government. The federal government, uh, FHWA and USDOT sanctioned them. I, I forget one for a few years, another one for like 10 years. And I forget, they got thrown off. They had a major project in Texas, the Harbor Bridge. And um, I would never seen this before where um, Texas DOT just said, you're off, you're done. They're in the middle of an $800 million bridge construction project and they just threw their engineer of record off for something that happened across the country. Um, I'd never seen anything like that. I didn't even know that was legally possible. Um, so, so yeah, that, that, that's kind of the proscript of what's going on now. And um, with that, that's really all I had to present. And I, I don't know if, if you have questions or have some things you'd like to talk about. Uh, Jason, what, I, what are your thoughts? Well, I have a lot of thoughts, but I, I think my, one of my first questions is, is as, we, as we sort of harken back to early on as you were talking um, and setting the context for this design, how it had these aesthetic aspects that were not necessarily functional for the structure of the bridge, why not just make it a cable state bridge? Is it because it wouldn't have met the criteria that was requested by um, the owner? I think it's just cost. You know, it's cost. The, so a cable state you, bridge would have been more expensive I mean, than what they did. A cable state bridge is really like a, it's a long span bridge. You, yeah. you know, Th this wasn't a long span situation, but everybody loves the way a cable state bridge looks. It, it just looks so good, especially when you got a single plane, you know, and, um, but it, it just wasn't required here. And to force it in there would just be, um, silly and needless and expensive. So, so it, it wasn't, it was the right, it, it was what the, 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 they determined the owner wanted those aesthetics, but structurally just wasn't required or, or rational to try to provide it. Right. And probably would not have met the cost thresholds of the bid. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just, I'm struck by the, 
many areas of innovation without redundant and then with, without a maybe over, additional emphasis on redundancy. When you talk about single plane trust, um, uneven trust cords and the spacing of those and almost a, I don't want to say a non-standard use of materials, but using concrete for truss cords. Um, There's more. They used a type of concrete that had never been used in a bridge <laughs> structure right. before. They so used just, this titanium dioxide, dioxide mix oh wow. um, that's white and, and um, self-cleaning. Uh, it, it looks like it worked fine, probably be, will be used in the future for um, structures. So, so <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's other innovations that we didn't even talk about that they did all at the same time. Which is really impressive that they would bring so many innovations into one small-ish bridge. But just from the common sense aspect of it, you think to yourself, when you're bringing all these together, um, that level of complexity should elicit additional redundancy or additional safeguards <laughs> just just or because of the risk. Hours. Yeah. Or additional hours. Yeah. So that, engineers. But it also as we as we sort of look at, you know, forensic engineering over time, it highlights when bridges or any structure really are most at risk. And so the three most common are during construction, which played out in this particular case when you have some extreme loading cases and that are really pushing the envelope uh, on the design and really when they start to age and they have a lot of deferred maintenance or some things just over time start to accumulate. And so this is, this falls directly into when during construction, when it's at most risk. So I think that's definitely an area that well, most construction engineers and designers do do specific cases and, and run those analysis. But, highlighting the importance if you're going to highlight focus your resources to reduce your risk whether it's you as a designer but also as uh when the check was being made i know there was some debate on the contract and that structure, structure. of that and what the scope of work was for that but that that definitely played out to be true in this case as well um, the, the the final budget for the independent reviewer by the way that they that they negotiated in the end yeah. It was 50 grand. It might've been 55 grand. Yeah. And this is a pretty big bridge design firm and their name, they were in the process of being acquired anyways, but I mean, their name will never be heard again. <laughs> so it didn't totally destroy the firm because they were basically being bought out. But it, if, if they hadn't been in the process of being, it, it, it almost worked out fortunately, but a $50,000 task can like destroy a firm. Right. You know, and, and what's fascinating there, too, is um, that independent review engineer, um, he he um, he was laid off from the firm like a month after he finishes his, his review and um, the, the bridge didn't collapse for like another year. So it's not like he was laid off because the bridge collapsed. So that didn't happen until a year later. So when he was negotiating this budget. I can just imagine the sort of pressure that he was under and it, and it might have been rational for him. You know, let's say he needed 200 grand to do a really detailed, you know, look at all the construction sequences, look at all, maybe he needed 150, maybe 100, I don't know. Um, look at all the construction sequences, look at all the nodes, do a, really the right, the right review. Well, then I think his first proposal was like 125. 125,000 or something like that. They talked him down to 50 when he took all that stuff out. It, it, it might've been the right decision for him if he needed to pay his mortgage for a couple more months. <laughs> you know, he, 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 it, it might've been the wrong decision for the firm, but you know, they were likely squeezing him so hard. They're, they're about to sell their firm. They want the numbers to look good for the sale. I, I'm totally speculating here. But they're pushing him, you know, you got to be billable. And he's he's scrambling for billable work. And the best he can get is 50 grand. Well, at least it'll keep him going for another month or two. Um, you can see all these pressures at play and why why they would agree to do something like that, even though, you know, it's um, not rational. I, I imagine he was under a lot of a lot of pressure. I mean, he ended up getting laid off a month later. So um, right. Yeah, a lot of influencing factors. So you talk to environmental factors, you know, client decisions, 
the designers themselves and their their personal situation, designers, their parent organization, um, you know, work workplace factors. I mean, there, there's a ton of things that can contribute to this. And I think when you went through the five whys exercise, it starts to peel back the onion to expose the possibility of some of those. And I think just stepping back a little bit, thinking less as an engineer and more as somebody's interested in infrastructure and how um, how we design going forward and you know, in a way, some of the common sense aspect of it, there does seem to be some communi clear communication and judgment um, errors in this and maybe a, a misunderstanding or the unclarity of the level of authority that folks had on site when they saw something unsafe. There's a, an old moniker again on uh, engineering sites or whenever you're doing something that's risky that everybody is a safety person. Now, anybody would have, that would empower anybody to have the authority to say, hey, I see something, this is very concerning. I think this is unsafe. And they have the authority then either maybe shut down the job site or do something that would at least isolate that particular risk from the general public. Um, and I think that was a failure in this particular case from my perspective, just like an editor from a leadership perspective. But yeah, as we I think it kind of fell through the cracks and basically everybody on site deferred to the designer because it's a pretty complex structure and they, they were asking the designer, is this, <laughs> looks like a problem, is this okay? And the designer wasn't on site. He's trying to make sense of the photos. He's trying to make sense of the model. His staff engineers are out there and the best he could tell, he said, uh, you know, no, it's not a problem, it's okay. And they just believed him. And so he didn't have all the information from the site and the site thought he knew best. And it, it's it's really unfortunate that, you yeah. So if we, if we look at moving forward infrastructure and, I'm a member, you know, of public, and I am sort of starting in my mind. I assume that with technology and the tools that we have, and computers and the techniques, whether it's engineering equations or experience of our engineering teams, I assume that keeps pace with the cutting edge designs, the the longer span bridges, the taller buildings and um, the complexity. And that, that's sort of, I think that's my assumption of the engineering profession if I'm a member of the public. And so I'm curious on your thoughts in this case, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. Now that, that simplifies the challenge, I believe, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so they did, they, the designer did like three different models of of this area of the structure. They had three different uh, structural models and, and different software packages. And then, you know, the, the FHWA did multiple different models. And the thing is, it's so complex and, and you never, nothing's ever fully modeled, you know? It's, it's uh, there need to be simplifications in the model and the different models get different answers and you need to try to figure out why that which assumption where, I mean, it's there, there's no like just hit a button and it, and your computer perfectly understands exactly what you're going to build. Right. I mean, the cold joint, the pipe penetration, all the laps in the concrete, the anchorages in the post tensioning, none of those things are in any of the models. You know, it, the, the models got like the general size of the concrete and the, the sort of like general, um, cross-sectional area of the steel and stuff but it doesn't have the hyper detail of, of real life. And that's where a lot of those, in, in something that's so unique and complex like this node, I think that's where, um, where trouble can creep in. Yeah, I think, I think reconciling that thought of trying to push the cutting edge while the technology, maybe the specificity and detail of your software package, your, your model, isn't quite there um, and highlighting at that particular point that those two don't reconcile that you're trying to do something more than where technology is at and so building additional safeguards is warranted you know in this case maybe the budget didn't allow it which is still a red flag but um but yeah it's i think it's it, it's definitely interesting um but uh yeah very very interesting topic scott so i the bigger a big question for you so what you clearly passionate about this topic and well right in and what really drew you to it what what uh why this one 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, the when I had the opportunity to kind of volunteer for for uh, to work on this, um, it and then was was able to join the team and, and lead the technical team. I mean that. Uh, I was just excited to do it. And then once I got into it, I mean, I think it's fascinating. I hope to do a lot more work on it. I hope this isn't our first conversation. And I, we intentionally had you come into this conversation, right? Like without um, uh, knowledge of the, any beyond just whatever you might have picked up. Um, but you didn't know about the specifics of this project. I hope we'll talk about it again as it moves yeah. forward. I think there's a lot of really fascinating aspects. I hope to get deeper into it. Um, I can't tell you, I bought, I think, I mean, ultimately most of the engineering we do is you kind of learn from failures, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, and, um, this is a huge, um, opportunity to do that. And I'm also, I'm super interested in the human aspects of engineering projects and incentives and the business aspects of projects. And, um, to me, I think I, I like we got from that from that um asking the the five or six why is you're really getting to the business and human aspects as the source of this failure which is i guess probably the source of all failures and uh to some but here they they seem very plain and to me that that's that's the cause and um and uh so i'm interested to explore that that more and keep keep going deeper right yeah i think there could be lots of different conversations when we think about the human aspects of this and how it intersects with the engineering.